what up what up youtube what up my youtube crew my sinuses have been acting up so bad just the last few minutes and i'm like oh my gosh so pray for me as i get through this episode <laughs> okay boost this mic up a little bit more so the potters can hear me all right we just gonna hop into it because I love church. I don't worship myself tired and ate some bison nachos Ooh, by this this place in our, in Jacksonville Town Center. It's called something Ted Montana, but it was really, really good. And I had a, and in the same eating, I had a, um, <laughs> uh, a vegan burger with cheese, but it was good. It was good. Anyway. Let's get into it, because there's a lot to cover. And look, there's an error. Send. Can I record now? Nope. Don't send. Look. Quit. Audacity. Nope. Don't want to save it. Survive. Yes. Sorry, y'all. I got a new computer and I still haven't completely set it up yet. So, thank you for your patience. <laughs> All right, then we're ready. What up, crew? What's good? It's your girl, Shy Day, always ready for another episode of the Crew Book Club podcast. Thank you all for locking in with me again. I appreciate the love and support. As you know, right now, if you have not done so already, please leave some crew love by rating the podcast five stars and leaving a written review, especially my Apple listeners. I really, really would appreciate it. Thank you so much for the crew love. And we have a lot to dive into this episode with our book, The Mountain Is You. I literally wish I could read it to you and go over every pinpoint. <laughs> That's why it's so important for you to get this book. The link is in the show note for you to order it because it's just too much juice on each page. You hear me? Now, Brianna Weiss has done an amazing job writing this book. And this is going to be so 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 good and i can't wait to get into it so let's go but before we even get into the book you already know we gotta do who gonna check me boo god is he is always checking us and it keeps us what in check and this week checks comes from songs chapter 11 and it's the whole thing, verses 1 through 7, but I'm going to focus on verse 7. And it reads, For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice, the upright will see his face. And it's like, we. these are the notes that came to me while reading the scripture. And I, and I was reading and I was sitting on it, and it was like, we have to do the right and justice things at all times. Our integrity is important. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect or you're going to be perfect. Like God already prepared for that because Jesus died for our sins. At the same time, to have integrity with others, we need to have it with ourselves first. Um, and while reading this, I was like, okay, the government definitely needs to hear this. And this could literally change the world. You're talking about some world peace. It should be world of integrity, right? I feel like that's definitely a measure, something that we can measure. If we handled each other just as good on the outside and perception as we did on the inside, we would be a better world. And then I was like, well, first, let me change my world. Let me be the person who operates and be right and just at all times with the people that are in my life. And it starts with you, like changing the world starts with you. It starts with one person at a time. And so let's focus on the connections that we are directly linked to because we're all, it's all a chain. We're all the body of Christ. All right. So that is our world. All right. So we can do right by our family, our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues, the person that you want to flick off just because they honked at you at the green light. You should be saying thank you because they just letting you know 
that you wasn't paying attention. That is just, that is righteous <laughs> to let our fellow brethren know when the light is green. <laughs> okay. But seriously, though, this is how we change the world. We have to start with ourselves. And because the Lord is righteous and he loves justice, we could we could do it in his name. So doing it right is not just for you. Please understand. You know, it is doing right because we serve and represent God. So Jesus can examine you just like the scripture says in, ver in chapter 11, verse 4 and 5. It reads, the Lord is the holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. He, his eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. And see, this is, this is the eyes who are looking at you. Those are the eyes that are observing you. So you might not want to do right by someone because of what they've done to you. Just no, at the end of the day, you're doing right because he, God, is requiring you to do right. And that's between him and you. No matter what that other person, oh, look. And the other person might be like, oh, they bowed down to me, da 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 They might be on their soapbox because you apologize to them. But remember, it's not a, or did right by them or gave them justice. You're doing it because that's what God has asked of us to do. Okay? So that was what really checked me was no matter what people have done to me, I can only continue to do right by them because I'm not doing it right to you just because of you. I'm doing it right because of who I serve. All right. And that is what really matters. So that's the who on check me boo. A God is, he is always checking us and I love being checked by him because it keeps me right. Okay, now y'all already know the book. If you've been listening, we have a partnership with Audible where you can click the link and you can get 30 days of a free audio premium experience. And this is more than podcasts. They have wellness and all those things. But I really like the Audible books and having that partnership for you guys because I know a lot of us are entrepreneurs, dual entrepreneurs where we're working full-time jobs, part-time entrepreneurs, moms, wives, busy, busy, busy. At the same time, there's always an opportunity to, to read. And the fact that Audible gives you the opportunity to hear the book while you're being busy, it could help. So definitely click that link so you can get the Audible book experience. All right. Now, whoo, let's get into chapter two and three. Chapter two, there's no such thing as self-sabotage. In chapter three, your triggers are the guides to your freedom. Ooh. Chapter three reminds me of the sermon we just, we were at church and pastor, my pastor Tim was talking about how the pain and the things we go through can catapult us into our purpose, which that's a whole sermon. That's a whole word. It was really good. Um, but anywho, let's focus. <laughs> let's focus on the book. I won't get sidetracked. So chapter two, there's no such thing as self-sabotage. She starts off with it in this way. The habits and behaviors you can't stop engaging in, no matter how destructive or limiting they may be, are intel intelligently designed by your subconscious to meet an unfulfilled need, discipline, emotion, or neglected desire. Mm. Whew. Listen to that. Like The habits and the behaviors you can't stop engaging in no matter how destructive or limiting they may be, are intelligently designed by your subconscious to meet an unfulfilled need, displaced emotion, and neglected desire. That is deep. Woo, okay. Ooh, page um, 28 goes to overcoming self-sabotage. It's not about trying to figure out how to override your impulses is the first determining why those impulses exist in the first place. Self-sabotage is not a way we hurt ourselves. Is it a way we try to protect ourselves? So the self-sabotaging you're doing is unknowing that you have gone through so much that you try to protect yourself, but you're actually causing sabotage. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like... It's too good to be true, so I'm going to sabotage it. Mm -hmm. So what is self-sabotage? 
in her words, self-sabotage is when you have two conflicting desires. One is conscious, one is unconscious. You know how you want to move your life forward, and yet you are still, for some reason, stuck. Okay? She says, some people don't figure out why they can't seem to motivate themselves enough to create a new business, facilitate their goal of becoming significantly wealthier, perhaps not realizing that they have subconsciously believed that it's too be rich is too egocentric or disliked we talked about this in our last book we shall all be millionaires okay the avoidance of wealth and going after something because we associated with something bad no 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 she says here or perhaps they actually don't want to be super wealthy maybe it's a cover-up for wanting to feel secure and taken care of of their real desire is to be recognized for their art and as this feels too unlikely to ever happen, they fall back on secondary dream that doesn't actually motivate them. Now, this is where the association with wealth has to go beyond just wanting to be rich and to be wealthy. It's like, is are what you, is what you do is what you are doing aligning with the purpose and will of God. And this is God wasn't mentioned in this passage, but this is where I bring it in, right? Because um that's my faith base that's my belief if i'm doing the will of god if it's not aligning what society says i need to do to bring wealth then it's most important that i'm doing his purpose so then it will all align and he will grant me wealth in those things right so <laughs> that's how i recognized it you have to see like why am i doing the things i'm doing at the moment am i doing because it's my purpose to be doing and the art of it all, or I'm doing it just to be wealthy so people can perceive me as good. Mm, right? So let's talk about it on page 30. It says, perhaps it is because they understand at some level that being successful doesn't really make you happy nor light. In fact, the opposite tends to be true. Success usually exposes you to jealousy and scrutiny. Successful people are not loved in the way that they are imagined they would be. They are usually picked apart because envious people need to humanize them on the same way. Perhaps instead of being successful, they may that what many really want is just to be loved. And yet their ambition for success directly threatens that. Yikes. You ever listen to like an artist or someone famous who gets a lot of recognition? It's like you love, they love to see you going hard and relatable to see you coming out the mud. And then when you make it, you're like, where did all this hate come from? These were the same people that were supporting me, not a hating. And in actuality, they're just trying to find a way to humanize you because of where you are. And you're not doing it to be happy nor to be light. That's not success. It tends to be the opposite. Ooh, wow. Yeah, that, that was good. <laughs> and I'm sitting here having a moment again, like all the love and support that I'm getting from doing this and to lift me up, there are going to come a time where someone's going to come and be like, ah, that ain't it, da 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 You shouldn't be in this position, what you doing? You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, to prepare myself to master myself so I won't sabotage and try to dumb down Whatever it is that God has pulled me through to make you comfortable, no, 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 not gonna happen. <laughs> okay. On page 31, it talks about what does self sabotage look like for us to know what it to know what it is to be able to recognize it so we can check it. Here are some main signs that you're probably in the cycle of self sabotage. Listen, resistance, hitting your upper limit, uprooting, perfectionism limited emotional processing skills, justification, disorganization, attached to what you don't really want, judging others, pride, guilt of succeeding, fear of failing, downplaying, unhealthy habits, being busy, spending time with the wrong people, and worrying about irrational fears, less likely um, circumstances. And these are main signs that you're probably in a cycle of self-sabotage. And throughout this chapter, she breaks down each one to give it what it is and how to resolve it. And I had asked on our Instagram poll, 
which ones would you all want to cover? And the top ones was justification, attached to what you really want, and guilt of succeeding. I'm gonna tell you, and I'm speaking this, my old self-sabotaging habits, me personally, was perfectionism, fear of failing, and being busy, okay? But I wanna read the ones that you all requested. So with justification, let's talk about it. What is the justification when it comes to self-sabotage? Justification is your life is ultimately measured by your outcomes, not your intentions. <laughs> it's not about what you wanted to do or would have done it but didn't have time. It's not about why you thought you couldn't. It's just whether or not you eventually did. When we have a goal, a dream, or a plan, there is no measure of intent. It is only whether you did or did not. Any other reason you offer for not showing up and doing this work is simply you stating that you prioritize that reason over your ultimate ambition, which means that it will always have precedent in your life. Now, how do you resolve the justification? Start measuring your outcomes and focusing on at least doing one productive thing each day. And that goes to the book, The One Thing, which we did earlier this year, okay? Stop accepting your own excuses Stop being complacent with your own justification. justifications. Start quantifying your days by how many healthy, positive things you accomplish and you will see how quickly you begin to make process. So that's focusing on the right one thing and not saying that it's going to only be one thing. It's just the focus right now. Okay. And stop coming up with justifying yourself for not succeeding. One second, guys. My, um... My laptop is going dead. I should have had this hooked up before. <laughs> but I was so eager to get started that I um that I messed up. So let me pause this audio and hook this up, okay? So that was justification, all right? Let's get into what you all requested was attachment to what you don't really want. Ooh. Now, when I read this, I was just like, dang, how many times have I done this? All right, so sometimes your dreams for your life are adopted from other people's preferences. Mine was going to college. I didn't want to go to college. Am I happy I went? Yes, because I had an experience. I met some really dope people. I reestablished my relationship with Christ, and I met my husband. Not saying that co the re college was the reason but being in that environment in those places i don't know any other reason why i would have been in tallahassee florida for that <laughs> for that and the experience i had at famu was just absolutely amazing but i did not go because of me i went for my parents right so she says here also on page 43 sometimes we fight endless to try to force ourselves to want something that we do not really want and it always leaves us empty because it isn't genuine desire. When you find yourself struggling with something, you have to ask yourself, do I really want this? Do I want the job or do I just like how the title sounds? Are you in love with the person or do you like the idea of the relationship? Are you still holding on to an outdated idea of what your greatest success will be? And if so, what would it be like to let it go? Whew. And I think sometimes we bring up a dream and discuss our dreams and goals with people that we feel like we have to continue them or we're going to look like they're a person who doesn't keep their word to themselves. Not necessarily. Your goals and things could pivot and change. And when they do, for me, it was when I was like, okay, what does God want me to do? Does God want me to go to college and be a psychiatrist to help kids? No, that ain't that ain't that wasn't it for me because I genuinely wasn't finding love in that. It wasn't coming, it wasn't coming easy, and it did not feel like purpose. And I had to try a few things. So don't don't get stuck trying to stay in something that you really don't want to fulfill someone else. Like you really need to we not just you, we really have to continue to go to God and be like, okay, God, what do you want me to do? So I won't end up with self-sabotaging and being attached to things I really don't want to do, right? Okay, so how do we resolve this? How do we resolve the attachment to what you don't really want? First, 
be willing to accept that maybe your success story doesn't look the way that you once thought it might. When we let go of what isn't right for us, we create space to discover what is. However, doing so requires tremendous courage to put your pride aside and see things for what they really are. Woo, that's good, that's good. <laughs> okay, the other one you guys asked about was guilt of succeeding. Guilt of succeeding. Okay, whew. <sighs> that's the thought process that so many people go through. One of the biggest mental barriers people face is the guilt that comes with finally having enough or more than one needs. This is on page 47. This can come from many different sources, but it ultimately boils down to feelings as though you don't deserve to have it, the guilt of succeeding. And the crazy part is I feel like it comes with this guilt because, especially if you're a good hearted person and you're trying to do the right thing and live an authentic life, which she talks about in this section as well. It's like, people will tell you, oh, you change, oh, you different since you have money. And it's just like, I have changed, I am different. And I'm different because one, this is different. <laughs> I'm in a different space and I'm trying to learn how to handle this success for myself. And if I can't, if I'm still figuring out figuring it out for me yeah I'm trying to figure it out for you too and how to handle it because a lot of times when people do become successful even with the little success I've had or people perceive me to have I've been told I act different or I'm not as accessible and it's just like no because I'm running two businesses and I can't afford the friend who's offended by me not giving the text back or the call back or being ultimately available because I'm trying to build generational wealth for my family. You're not going to take care of my kids when I die. So I want things to be in place for them. So if it takes me sacrificing calling you back, if it's not connected to what I have going on as far as business, will I call you back? Yes, I value my relationships. But I don't want to have people in my life that's offended by it or go down the rabbit hole. Or you not, you treat me like this, that, that. No, like I'm literally trying to figure things out. And if you're not bringing the value to my life to help me figure those things out, then we need to reevaluate our relationship. Or if you're not having empathy or sympathy for me in this moment of trying to figure out my successes, then we need to have a conversation. <laughs> you understand? So... How do I resolve this? And she says here, please realize that most extremely successful people have no guilt whatsoever. In fact, this feeling usually only comes up when you're stepping between not having enough and finally having enough. What you have to realize is that money and success are tools. They buy you back time and offer you the opportunity to help employ, influence, and change the lives of others. Instead of looking at your success as a status diff Dif different it, Jesus I can't say the word I know how to say it but it's not coming around a differentiator which will always make you feel bad and uncomfortable see it instead as a tool which you can do important positive things in the world in your own life so that is what's going to help us resolve that guilt of succeeding it's not that we feel guilty for where we're going, I guess it's the intention, not I guess, it's the intention of how we're using our success. Is our success and the the succeeding will only benefit us? Because that's when the guilt, but if you are succeeding and your wealth is being used for good intention, you won't have the guilt. Oh, that's good. All right, so those are the ones that you all requested to speak about. If you want to read more of the others, please order the book. They're really, really good to, to know what they are, recognize, and her giving us solutions on how to resolve them. Okay, so that was one of the main things I wanted to discuss in chapter two. Let's get into chapter three, okay? Oof, it's so much good stuff in here. I had in my notes to talk about 
the most common emotions that arise while you're breaking self-sabotage behaviors. But due to time, I definitely want you guys to go read the book and I might just discuss them on our social media. So if you should be following our Instagram and our TikTok at The Crew Book Club and also subscribing to our YouTube channel as well to see the visuals and shorts there. Um, and lock in, I, I spend more time going live on the Instagram. So if you really wanna connect, go there as well, okay? That'd be the main page I would say follow. I am having, where's chapter three? Okay, chapter three. Your triggers are the guides to your freedom. So good, so page 72. 71 is stars. It says, better understanding what our inherent needs are, what we really desire and how we can use this is a pivot point to begin building a life that is aligned with who we really are and what we are here to do. Each negative emotion you experience comes with a message, one that we do not yet know how to interpret. Okay, there's anger, there's... Um, Sadness, guilt, embarrassment, jealousy, resentment, regret, chronic fear. You know, those are how to, she talks about how to interpret negative emotions. And the thing is, and I, and I want to touch on anger, resentment, and chronic fear. Because those are the ones that I feel like will resonate with our, with our crew. Okay. And also ones that I directly um, struggle with and I feel like how we may have viewed them from the way that she wrote them will help us understand okay so she says anger anger is a beautiful transformative emotion I have never thought of anger that way I don't know about you but she says here it is a healthy it is healthy to be angry for example, anger shows us where our boundaries are. Anger also helps us identify what we find to be unjust. When we do not see it as such, we tend to bury it, not ever resolving the real issue at hand. This is when anger starts to cross over as aggression. So when we're angry, that is good that we're feeling that because we know our boundaries are being crossed. Now, how we deal with it, is gonna determine if it comes off as aggressive, okay? And this is why we cannot bury it and why we have to resolve our real issues, okay? So that that is important. Now, she discusses uh, sadness and, and guilt, but I wanna to touch em embarrassment and jealousy, but I wanna to skip to resentment, okay? This is something I've, I've struggled with. She says here on page 77, when we resent people, it is often because they did not live up to the expectation of them that we had in our minds, okay? That's why I think when you're meeting someone and getting into a relationship, whether it's a friendship, business, or with family, whatever it is, you need to have a conversation on what the expectations are so no one will have resentment. It's down to communication. She also says, it, resentment is some resentment in some ways is like a projected regret. It instead instead of trying to show us what we should change, it seems to want to tell us what other people should change. Yikes! Because it's not about them. This is what we have to take accountability. It's about us and how we should change. Like for an example, I used to be a person. It was everybody else's fault from where I ended up. Not the fact that I chose to either be with this person or do these things. It was because of them that I ended up here, quote unquote. The moment that I took full accountability of the people I chose to hang around with, the people I chose to sleep with, the people I, whatever that was, I had to take accountability for that. Because people just don't do things out of the blue. There's always signs we just choose to ignore them. Okay, because we're expecting them to change when they've shown who they are instead of us changing and to not pick those people or things to do, right? She says here also on page 77, when we are faced with resentment, 
What we instead must do is to reinvent our image of those around us or those we have perceived as having wronged us. Other people are not here to love us perfectly. They're here to teach us lessons to show us how to love them and ourselves better. Okay, when we release the idea we have about who they should be, we can see them for who they are and the role they are meant to play in our lives. Instead of focusing on how they should change, we can focus instead on what we can learn. Do y'all got it? <laughs> I literally wrote for these for those last two paragraphs, yikes, wow, and got it. It's not about what it's not about me focusing on how they should change. It's me focusing on what I should learn from the situation. That's the accountability of it all, right? I can waste my energy going back and forth about what the shoulda, coulda, wouldas, but let's, okay, let's look at the lessons learned so this won't happen again, <laughs> okay? And then, y'all already know, I talked about fear. One of the things I'm overcoming is fear of failure. And fear of failure, she talks about chronic fear. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. Decline. Okay. So, chronic fear. When we cannot stop returning to fearful thoughts, it is not always because there is an actual threat in front of us. Often it's because our internal response systems are underdeveloped or sidelined by trauma. Ooh, because we go into that defensive mode of trying to protect. You know what I'm saying? And that is where I kind of felt like, okay, so this is my, let me recognize what my fear is. It's my fear because I'm scared to do this or is it the fear, the trauma that I've experienced in my past and I'm trying to protect myself and I'm just like, okay, let's dive into this. She says on page 79, the only true way to get over chronic fear is actually to go through it. Be about that action. The second we are able to shrug, laugh, or even just throw our hands up and say, Whatever, it'll be fine. We instantly take back all of our power. The same way I felt about starting this podcast or what I might sound on the microphone or if I don't always say the words right or if I don't always get my point across in the few minutes that I'm on here with you guys. So what? Just get through it, do it, and keep it moving. I was telling somebody, you know, I don't listen to a clip more than twice. If I'm, you know, editing the clip and everything because if I pay attention too much, the fear will sink in and I won't post it or I won't do it. So instead of focusing on it too much, I just jump in, do it, and whatever happens, happens. <laughs> okay. So those are the three that I wanted to focus on. Your triggers as a guide to your freedom. Please, there's so many different ones in this book that I think would resonate with you guys. So check that out. Um, there's, ooh, there's so many good points that I want to hop into, but for the sake of time, I'm going to, to, to encourage you to order the book. That link is in the show note or listen to it on, on audible. So you can get all the gems that I got from it. Okay. So, you know, we love giving a challenge of the week here on the crew and the challenge this week is inspired, um, from the chapter's that we covered today, chapter two specifically, and it is get clear, okay? When we override an issue instead of facing it ahead on, we sabotage ourselves even more. So you're going to strengthen in self-sabotaging behavior because you aren't really resolving the problem by just trying to override it. Instead, start asking the right questions. So I want you to Get your pen and paper out and get clear or look at your, your timer right now and screenshot where we dropped off so you can do this challenge of the week, okay? And write down these questions and really answer them. One, why do I feel this way? What is this feeling trying to tell me about the action I am trying to take? Is there something I need to learn here? And what do I need to do to honor my needs right now? Then you have to reconnect your inspiration or your vision of life. Get clear on why you want to take this action and make a change, okay? So the most common emotions that arise while you're breaking self-sabotaging behaviors, 
this these questions will help you do that another thing part two of this challenge is to fully release those feelings once you are aware of them try writing yourself a letter write something to your younger self or from the perspective of your future self write down a mantra or a manifesto remind yourself that you love yourself too much to settle for less or that if it's is it okay to be angry in an unfair, frustrating circumstances? Give yourself space to experience the depth of your emotions so that they do not control your behaviors. It's like once you recognize it, see and ask yourself these questions on why you feel this way, what you need to do to make it right, what you can learn from it so you can check it and move forward and not get stuck and self-sabotage yourself and make it worse. So that's your challenge of the week. Get clear with your emotions so you will not sabotage yourself any longer, okay? <laughs> All right, so, oh, it just made me look. See, if you do the challenge on page 66 and 67, like I'm asking you to, and you order the book, there's a section called Disconnecting Action and Feeling on there too. And it's like to... Ooh, to you can't always bake you can't always do based on how you feel sometimes you just have to do and elf how you feel for real because <laughs> your feelings could sabotage you from accomplishing your goals okay so definitely get into it y'all get into it <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious <laughs> All right, so that was the challenge of the week. And you know, sometimes when we need help getting out of our heads, I know one of the things that helped me that you want to continually do therapy. And thank goodness for our partnership with BetterHelp, the Crew Book Club. They allow, they've given us the opportunity to get 10% off your first month of professional therapy through betterhelp.com slash crew love. I use better therapy. It's convenient. Y'all already know the spiel. <laughs> if you've been listening to the pod, um, you can literally go in your car. You can change up the therapist if you want. If you're not vibing with that therapist no more, it's like, okay, cool. Can we get somebody else? Like interview, treat it as interviewing them. Get on the phone with them, talk to them. And if they're not connecting, be like, thank you. I'm not having the experience that I think I want to have. Can I go to somebody else? But I remember this therapist. I was at this event and she was saying, give the therapist at least three times. A lot of us go to therapy one time and then be like, this ain't it. But this is the first time of you doing this with them and learning how to open up. Give, the, give yourself and them an opportunity to get comfortable um, before you just keep hopping and skipping. So try the therapist at least three times and if it's not working out then move forward okay and with better help they're very understanding and can do that for you all right so let's get into what would the crew do ask advice you can email at the crew book club at gmail.com or dm on our ig at the crew book club to get your questions and the last few of the questions have been related to hot topics um in our social media which is fine I appreciate it, but you know, I love getting personal with you guys. You guys can ask any questions, um, but I appreciate you guys locking in and caring about my thoughts <laughs> on some of these headlines. The last one was about Ebony K. Williams and that, and this one, someone was like, do you believe it's appropriate to split bills with your spouse 50-50? And I'm sure this is coming from, they sent the post with uh, Gabrielle Union on it. And I listened to the whole interview and I just felt like everybody has their own way of doing things. Um, but then I was listening to The Breakfast Club and I like how um, Charlemagne was making the point of you really can't measure the time that people equate. Specifically being a mom, we take on a lot of brunt work of it all so whether someone is covering all the financial yeah but let's think about if they're not handling the child the day-to-day -day, the things like that it's like it's really hard to measure but for someone like them where they're both making money and they're both actually taking care of other families like you don't know what and I, what's going on everybody's different but if that's what you agree upon and you communicate that so there's no resentment 
and your relationship and that's what works for you, then go right ahead. Everybody has their own way of doing things. And I think also as you grow in your relationship, the times could change where one minute this person is contributing more or that person is not. It's all teamwork and effort and everything takes time um, to get to a point. But when it comes to splitting bills with your spouse, that's going to be between that's going to be between you and your spouse and what works for you. And you have to and I would say don't even share that information with anybody because it's one it's none of their business and two they can't judge. And if you share with the wrong people, they're going to have so much to say that you could be self you could be sabotaging your own situation sharing something that worked for you and now you feel like because society said that shouldn't be what it is, now you mad and your relationship isn't it based off what somebody else say. <laughs> So when I when it comes to bills between spouses, that's their business and leave it alone. <laughs> All right. Thank you for DMing, DMing me that question. I love it. Now, let's end this episode with a good quote of the week to send you out into your week. And this quote comes from chapter three, page 95. You begin experiencing feelings of peace and joy in your life when you condition yourself to take repeated daily actions that facilitate clarity, calmness, healthiness, and purposefulness, not the other way around. So guys, I want you to go out there and experience a feeling of joy and peace in your life and get clarity and calmness and healthiness and purposefulness for you and keep it moving. All right. Thank you for tuning in with the Crew Book Club podcast, and I will holler at y'all later. Hey!